Hi everyone! Welcome to The XX Factor, episode 5, not episode 4 as I originally had in the title. Um, Am I wrong? Huh? Am no, I you're wrong? right. Okay. You're right, the last yeah. episode was 5. Yeah. Um, yes. That was 4. Yeah, so anyway, um, welcome to The X Fac XX Factor. This is the show where we discuss the gender critical movement and kind of the conspiracy theories behind it. Um, last week we did quite a heavy bit on a certain person in particular who we're going to be talking about again this this episode and also it's where it touched on I guess anti-semitism and there was a lot of very heavy transphobia and there was violence so just a warning to everyone this episode is going to be like more of the same so if you're not ready for that it like it was quite dark last week so it's probably going to get into that again anyway as you may have noticed we have a special guest so first, I'll just introduce myself. I am Katie Montgomery. I am someone who argues on the internet because I'm a dickhead and I'm also a trans woman and I'm a feminist and that's why I'm here. This is my lovely co-host, Krista. Would you like to uh, introduce I'm a philosopher um, and someone who screenshots on the internet. That <laughs> <laughs> is this woman. And uh, I got an instant involvement with stuff through philosophy. And then we're also joined by Josh Stein. Who would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm a doctoral candidate in philosophy at the University of Calgary. Um, and then I, for about the last 10 years, I've been working on, among other things, uh, anti-Semitism and extremism in America. Uh, it's not the subject of my dissertation, but I could probably pretty easily have written a dissertation on from my, from my experience. And I talk about anti-Semitism on the internet a lot. Because which is why we somebody got has on. to yeah yeah somebody has to um which is why we got on so anyone who did see last week's episode uh there was quite a lot of that kind of stuff and we thought it'd be good to get someone who knows more about it than we do um to like discuss the the theories and where things are going and why they always end up going this way um so yeah um do let us know if the sound is good and the picture looks good and everything in the live chat. And um, yeah, I suppose let's start. Do you have any like opening things you want to discuss to start with? Um, well, to do like to add to the introduction, I feel like last episode I just kind of dumped all this information, um, all these screenshots uh, out um, without having very much time to like process what was going on. Um, yeah. And so this episode we wanted to kind of just like go into that more um, and talk about what exactly is happening here um, and, and takeaways that it seems like we should have from that. Uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was quite full on last week, like it was like two hours of screenshots and then we're just, everyone's brain was rotted and that was the end. <laughs> so yeah, this will be a, a more in-depth conversation, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, wicked. Okay, I guess we can move on to some screenshots then, if you're ready. Oh, yeah. Am I showing them? Am I? Yep, everyone yes. can see now. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, I wanted to start with an update, uh, which was last week, um, one of the ending notes about like what practically um, we could do going forward um, was that Jennifer Billick was going to be speaking at this um, conference on March 8th, uh, Monday now, um, with Helen Joyce, who is a writer for The Economist and one of the more mainstream gender critical people. Um, and the day, I think, after um, the episode and after we started tweeting about it, um, Billick, they posted, had to pull out of the conference due to family commitments. Um, and now it seems like has been replaced by my force setter. Um, so I think that kind of... It was interesting <laughs> timing. Like there's, for sure, she could have just had a family thing. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily claim that we did a podcast and they changed the thing, but it's it's interesting timing for sure, at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think less, um, less subtly, um, in the chance it was <laughs> related, um, I think it kind of speaks to the, like, I think there's a strange kind of parallel between, like, the 
And these kind of theories about, in particular, Jewish people have kind of proliferated for a while and nothing really has <laughs> happened. Um, but then seeing like the more explicit stuff um, maybe causes some movement. Um, so saying that, um, I haven't seen any any of the like big gender critical people comment on anything because oh, yeah. I know you're I like you you did a, a big thread on it and that got you know that went round the whole sort of trans Twitter um, it, you know everyone's seen it the, they must be aware of it there's no way they're not aware of it and they know how influential she is and just none of them have spoken of it so um, yeah I, I was actually talking to um, an ex gender critical person earlier today and saying about how none of them have called it out. And um, they were saying that like quite often they will just be, be like, Oh, they're not a real gender critical person. You know, they're, they're not like a radical feminist. They're not part of us. They're just like a convenient ally. So we don't need to address it. And we're not going to, because if we do address it, it makes it look like we're admitting they're part of us. So that might be where they have their, their heads down on it. But well, I, I mean, one of the things that Krista noted when talking about this was that even though a lot of the same material got used by um, Jane Claire Jones and some other people, there was a pretty active avoidance of discussing Billick publicly. Um, and I, there are probably a few reasons for that. I mean, my biggest experience with this tactic comes from two groups. Um, one of them is I think pretty obvious is sort of the Christian groups that pull the no true Scotsman stuff and just say, okay, well, like Mel Gibson is just a, a way out there, right? He's not one of us really, um, which obviously gets a little bit disingenuous. But the other where this is quite common was with the ecofash groups, um, which is obviously part of where Billet comes from. Um, and we'll talk uh, probably a little more about that because Billet's affinity for David Icke, I think is pretty fundamentally related to their shared um, attachment to um, eco-fascist con conspiracy theories um, and that sort of shared affinity and political inclination. So, I, I mean, I'm not super surprised if we see that tactic. Um, I'm not yeah. surprised if people just try and create distance. Yeah, um, they'll just take the theories, they'll take out the bit that like the really crazy stuff and they'll just take the rest and just pretend that's, you know, they didn't come from them. Yeah, so just to say a little more about like what I see looking at this. Uh, so Jane Claire Jones, I think, is one of the people who is most um, invested in maintaining um, apparent distance from the right. Um, she really wants to present the movement as a left-wing um, movement. <laughs> Um, and, but I see like, looking at her <laughs> history with this stuff is, um, a little engagement with Billick around like 2018. Um, and then it just like, totally cuts off and she is, continues to talk about the same thing. She's talking about Rothblatt and stuff where uh, everyone else I see talking about Rothblatt is like basically immediately talking about Billick. Um, and every time she talks about this stuff, people are replying with, um, <laughs> like, you should follow Jennifer Billick um, with links to Billick's stuff. And she just never, I didn't see her ever engage with right. that. It just seems like very um, intentional avoidance, um, which I, I, I would guess that she was not aware of the explicit anti-Semitism stuff, but it was instead like the right-wing stuff where Billick is um, regularly writing for pretty far-right outlets, um, which... As all of the gender critical movement are, including it, it Jane was... Claire Jones, who just wrote for the like Telegraph in the UK, which is a right-wing yeah. paper, but... Yeah, I think the Federalist is worse than the Telegraph. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, this is one... There's a source of tension between the American gender criticals who are always writing for, like, the Federalists um, who work with the Heritage Foundation um, and the UK ones who are more interested in this, these guys of not being far right. Um, even even <laughs> then though, like in the UK, they're still right for the Spectator and the Times and, and further right things like weekly. Yeah. So yeah, and this, this makes the Americans mad because they think it's just hypocritical. <laughs> they're yeah. like in the past for doing their stuff. Um, 
yeah, sorry. The, um, yeah, I haven't seen, I've seen a few gender critical people who aren't big names talk about it uh, and retweet it and say like, this is bad and it's something that we can denounce. Um, definitely the explicit stuff is something they can denounce, but um, yeah, the beginning, I think it's like exactly like Katie said, it's this comparison, like, this dual like thinking of them as allies in at least some sense um, and then thinking, but they're not us. <laughs> Um, because if they're if they're like totally unrelated, right? There's it's like no skin off your back to be like this is bad, um, but then there's that hesitancy. I, I think um, often that the like the people of the feminist background in the gender critical movement kind of see it like there's you know the trans people and all the the crazy people they hate there, and then there's like the right wing people and all the crazy people they hate there. And they're like, oh, in this case, the right wing people, we're, we're going to agree. So we'll just let them fight each other and we'll stand back and we'll just put one side with. And that's kind of how they view it. Whereas, like, I think it's much more kind of the other way around in that the huge, like, patriarchy um, right wing force is like, oh, here's a useful group, small group of people that we can use as a shield and we'll just use them. And, you know, I think they feel like the gender critical feminist side thinks they have a lot more control over where this is going than they realistically do. Um, and well, yeah. I, I think a part of it in the US is, um, and Billick is an American, right? So a lot of this stuff that's going on is in the British context, but, but Billick comes out of this American context where there is a very clear um, sort of spectrum of publications. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how these develop over time, but um, sort of moving as you move uh, right from, say, Fox and the New York Post to the Federalist, and then sort of slowly drift further and further into the, the right wing uh, nut job sphere. Um, <laughs> Good word. These things, these things get that well, they, they become um, more explicit. So, I mean, yeah. one of the th one of the things that's um, really noteworthy about uh, some of the quite vocal Rothblatt stuff that we'll get into is that um, it trades on a lot of the implicit stereotypes and a lot of the implicit um, norms around uh, anti-Semitism. But then we get into, oh, actually, you're just engaging with a guy with uh, SS bolts driven on drawn on his profile picture. Right, like there, there's a um, there's a convention in neo, and I'll refer to this a few times probably. There's a convention in uh, neo-Nazi circles talk called uh, quote naming the Jew unquote, um, and the idea of that is it has to do with the distinction between people who explicitly um, frame it as a Jewish conspiracy theory, like Keith Woods does, and someone who sort of just um, implies it or just names the particular figures. Right. Right. And so when we talk about um, the pivot, the, the sort of big transition in Billick that I see is going from, oh, it's Rothblatt, oh, it's the transhumanist, oh, it's the liberal elite, something, 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 um, sort of implicature to, oh, it's Judaism and transhumanism. Right. Yeah, it's and the, that's like, the, where that's the big, the yeah. yeah, yeah, that's where I, the big move is. Yeah, I think especially it's interesting to type it so like we start off um, getting big with this Federalist piece she did. Um, and in the Federalist piece, she names a bunch of people, right? So Jennifer Pritzker, George Soros, Martina Rothbaum, we're starting off Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. Um, but then I think not all these people are Jewish. Um, Tim Gill, um, Warren Buffett, it's not Buffett's uh, not. Yeah. And so you have other people in there, right? It's not, um, in the first instance, exclusively Jewish people. Um, then as we go on and see the things that she is focusing on, um, she's really particularly focused on Stryker, Pr Pritzker, Rothblatt. Uh, so you see that first level of like naming. Um, yeah, these other names I haven't seen come up at all other than this. Article. Yeah, right. Um, right. I've seen her mention Tim Gill a few times, but she really is focused on these other people. Um, so you see this first level of like going from the list to this particular focus, which happens even in this piece, um, she names all these people, but then um, she talks most about the Pritzkers and some about Rothblatt. Um, and then you see the 
kind of, I've heard people call this like soft anti-Semitism, where it's just um, focused on these things that these Jewish people are supposedly doing without calling them being explicit that they're Jewish. Um, yeah, so this is part of how the on-ramp works, right? Is is we pick out a particular group of figures to talk about, and there are a handful that are sort of emphasized. And over time, um, people recognize patterns, right? And so people will say, oh, isn't it interesting that all of the people who keep coming up in this are Jewish, right? And of course, it's not really an accident. Um, it, it's, it, it's certainly true that lots of Jewish people are um, liberal, or when you look at sort of the right-wing theories that lots of the people involved in Israel activism are um, Jewish, right? That, that shouldn't really surprise anyone, but it's also usually a feature of the fact that they um, get disproportionate attention um, in these yeah. sorts of articulations, right? So, I mean, the fact that Rothblatt is coming up in this stuff, and I mean, uh, Chris and I, I think have both talked about this at some length um, on Twitter, uh, Rothblatt is not as an especially major figure in the trans rights movement. No, um, like when I've said about Rothblatt, like everyone has been like, "Who?" <laughs> like all my yeah, trans and, friends and, just and do nothing, not. And nothing, nothing Rothblatt says is is especially different from no. um, the, than from the uh, cyborg style Haraway feminists of the of the eighties. So I, I mean, it's so set that aside, and and you say, well, why are we talking about Rothblatt? rather than literally anybody who's involved in funding these sorts of major LGBT charities. And Rothblatt actually is not a big funder. Um, well, there, yeah, that's like true too. includes her in these lists with these, uh, with these billionaires, um, but Rothblatt's yeah. not, she is rich, but she's not a billionaire and she's not like a major source of money. And the, the main stuff that they pull out to like firmly connect her to the movement um, is activism she was doing in the early 90s um, rather than actual funding. Yeah, and and I mean, I think I, I think you've even shown some stuff where Pete Rothblatt has been referred to as a billionaire, which she's not. Um, that was Jane Claire Jones's. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, the, there is a tendency to exaggerate these sorts of things, right? I mean, similarly, um, the level of involvement of people like um, Pritzker um, both Pritzkers actually, um, who are sort of, I mean, they're just broad LGBT donors, right? They're, they're not necessarily donating more money than any left-leaning political figure would donate for the tax write-off, right? I mean, all of these people run philanthropies because that's a major part of both your PR brand and your management of your taxes. And so there's nothing ex particularly interesting going on with that, um, except that the causes that they pick out happen to align with the values that they have, which is, I, I'm, yeah, it, it's not. It, it's it's not exactly surprising. the way that you would think it would work. Yeah, right? there's no conspiracy there. There's just um, this is what a it would look facing goal. If yeah. you were to imagine a world without any conspiracy theories, this is what it would probably be similar to. Yeah, yeah. where, where we still have billionaires. Yeah, with billionaires and like our kind of tech stuff. Yeah, so the Pritzker, Pritzker I think funds some, um, you've seen lists that are some like, trans-related projects. Um, like John Stryker, um, who <laughs> Billy Lively refers to as John Stryker gay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, like, there's a chart, she has a chart um, where that shows everything leading to the strikers because it's a chart of where the strikers are. Uh, but next to John Stryker, it's John Stryker, okay. <laughs> um, right. But he's just donating generally to LGBT causes. It's not actually trans specific at all. Um, and then like George Soros is donating generally to liberal causes. Um, not I, I actually think Stryker is a really interesting target for Billick because he's someone who's, um, you, I mean, you mentioned Billick's roots in sort of the ecofash stuff, but um, Stryker is basically known for two things. And one of them is uh, great ape conservation. Mm. I mean, I first learned about Stryker um, through the Arcus Project, which was really about, um, uh, at the time at least, was really involved in um, conservation activity. Um, and obviously as a, 
um, as a gay man, he, he incorporates lots of um, LGBTQ stuff into that. Um, but I, I mean, it's sort of interesting that, that he's one of the targets because in theory, he's um, one of these sort of people who might have been a convenient ally, but he's right. become fairly explicitly um, trans affirming into in his later work and his more recent work. Um, also, sorry, Ben. I will, um, with regard to like the subtle anti-Semitism stuff, um, the name striker doesn't read as Jewish to me. I don't know if that's just because I'm dumb, um, but compared to like Rothblatt um, and Pritzker, I, yeah, I only realized because people were talking about it in right. Yeah, when I saw this, I just googled everyone because I don't want to jump to conclusions on names, I guess. Um, well, so there's a long there's a long tradition of um, people changing their last names um, to anglophone last names to yes, pass, particularly um, in I mean, America, I think, right? Uh, in America, the UK, okay, um, in Germany too. I mean, I mean, lots of. Um, uh, especially sort of very stereotypical um, Jewish sounding, Jewish sounding names um, get, got changed. I mean, John Stewart is John Leibowitz, right? right? I mean, um, actually one of the sort of famous instances of Trump's anti-Semitism well before he became president was um, sort of emphasizing John Stewart's last name um, at, at orig, uh, his, his last name as John Leibowitz, Jonathan Leibowitz. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, this is quite a, a, last names can be deceiving in some cases, though in cases like the Pritzkers, I mean, Soros is a name that has Jewish connotations now, but I, I mean, it's basically just a Hungarian last name, right? I mean, yeah. it's not, I mean, I have a name that could easily be the name, the last name of a non-Jewish German person yeah um so so there's a lot of uh trickery there though like i said in the case of someone like pritzker or rothblatt right these are maybe names that that do have that sort of huh. more traditionally um ashkenazi vibe yeah I'm and with the um what you said about on ramping <laughs> where um what i'm being here is like the possibility and concern um, we have about people who are involved in people who start off in this case in the gender critical movement um, but then do this stuff move into um, I mean in general like just more general far-right politics but like anti-semitism in this case in particular um, and with this kind of stuff where um, the response of like a number of gender critical people that I've seen is that like well they like is just talking about the people involved. She has just done the research. These are the people involved. Um, and then when you have this, you're like set up to feel like it's organic, this like realization that these people are all Jewish. Um, it feels like, you know, she's just done the investigation and now you're looking at the results and it's like, oh, look at this. Um, and so on that though, I guess there's, there's one thing, cause like that, that does make sense. But one, one thing that kind of strikes me is if I was researching this, I read this article and I like found all these people and then I was like, oh, all of these people are Jewish. The first thing that would happen in my mind is this feels like a conspiracy theory. And I think I need to do a lot more research outside of this. I, I just think it's very odd that, you know, it nowadays in 2021, people will see a list of names who are billionaires who fund things and find they're all Jewish and then don't go, ah, something's up here. Because yeah, I think it works better over time. <laughs> um, yeah. I like if you if the first day you saw this you realized it um but you you know but if this the gender critical stuff is like central to them and if this becomes a central part of their um yeah, yeah you're world right. view, and then they realize it so so i when i when i talk about this stuff i tend to walk people through a sort of schema so i'm looking at my notes right now right so the the first sort of indicator of this, which I think is pretty banal and I think we all do it, um, though it has sometimes more of a malicious frame is what I, um, just asking questions. I used to refer to it as uh, jacking off, yeah. J-A-Q-ing off, um, right? 
and and sort of just trying to figure out what's going on in these sorts of cases um, and putting these questions forward. Um, then there's usually a transition to sympathetic media outlets, um, usually sympathetic media outlets that have some level of plausible deniability when it comes to anti-Semitism or homophobia or whatever you like. I mean, Fox um, comes to mind. The Federalist is becoming less deni has less deniability now than it used to. But I think at the time the article was published a few years ago, it was not as obvious that they were sort of um, going that going that route, and this is where we things start to get worrisome. Is as people read these articles or blog posts or whatever, they will start to see these sorts of patterns in who the figures are and who the names are, and that's when we get to that's one of the problems with the constant emphasis on Soros, the constant emphasis in this case on Pritzker and Rothblatt, um, and so on. Um, or historically, um, both in the UK and US, um, on Roth, the Rothschilds. Um, these are the sort of standard way of um, using the echoes, using the three parentheses, um, so that people get in, um, this, this understanding of the pattern. And then at some point, you cross the Rubicon into outright explicit anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, right? So, so um, this is sort of the way the, the process tends to work, right? It's not just that like someone reads an article and all of a sudden they're David Duke, <laughs> right? Like that's just not how it works, right? They sort of recognize these patterns over time. They build yeah. these theories up over time and they um, get them ingrained. And then you'll start to see people posting an image of all of these figures um, superimposed over Stars of David, which yeah. is a thing that happens. Um, quite frequently, unfortunately, um, and and that's the sort of the sort of um, process that's used for um, on ramping into outright anti semitism. Yeah, so, to... oh, sorry again. I, I was just I was going to say, well, we've gone on a bit of a tangent. I know you had like an order in your mind. Did you want to go back to the order? Do you want to just say what you're going to say and then go back to order, or do you, should we just carry on? Um, well, this is where we wanted to go, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, but so a question I um, wanted to ask you is, is like, so I think of um, the like full-blown Nazi-style um, anti-Semitic conspiracy. It's one that involves like basically all Jewish people. Um, it's like Jewish people in general are conspiring to do this, I think, um, which is, I feel like I think is not at that level right now. She's at a level where it's like, um, she's noticed the pattern um the pattern and now is um the though an update it, from this week her newest blog post has a i feel like might be a step in that direction uh, so first I guess yeah. <laughs> re review we'll come the, to that yeah it, this was like the um the most explicit um, the things we're getting um when we were talking about things last week where she had started um, she repeatedly shared this Keith Woods post about um, transhuman Judaism. Um, Keith Woods is I, this guy who is like, chatting with Richard Spencer um, because their politics are so similar. Um, and this, the transhuman Judaism thing, it's a, uh, um, it's pretty like me entering um, discussion of like why Jewish people are inclined towards this. Um, Thing rather than like, I think it was the full blown Nazi thing, which is like all Jewish people conspiring. Um, is that, do you think of that as like a further level, Joshua? Um, so I, I think that, yeah. So, so this was the one where I kind of went, oh, this is just explicit now. Yeah. Right? Like, this is not implicit anymore. Right? So the big distinction between I'm drawing it between the sort of Glenn Beck style, I'm drawing attention to these particular figures who all happen to be Jewish, right? This, this sort of patterning, as opposed to just outright saying there is a Jewish aspect of the trans human transgender stuff. Right, I mean, that's the phrase here that is, I mean, you highlighted it, right? I mean, it's right there. It's, it's um, and I think that's really important um, that there's recently, I mean, Chris and I talked about this um, a little bit beforehand uh, in the pre-interview 
Um, there's a book out, which I will not dignify the author's name, but is like just the straight white supremacist version of this, which draws pretty actively on Billick. Um, so, I mean, this isn't really implicit anymore. I, I mean, to say that there's a Jewish aspect um, is pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing I'll say here is that when you get into these conspiracy theories, most people will never say all Jews, right? So, so there are always the good ones, right? So the, 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 if you're on the far right in the United States, you're talking about Ben Shapiro and maybe Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump, people who you think of as Jewish, but still sort of allied. All great. But, but they always do that, don't they? They always have a, we need the good ones in order to legitimize we're not like homophobic because so we're not anti-semitic because we got our homies yeah who yeah. are who are um cool and we like them so we don't hate all jews yeah. we just hate the jews i mean so um the famous remark by farrakhan famous american anti-semite right is you know i i i don't hate i'm not anti-semite i'm anti-termite right is yeah. like the i'm not opposed to jews i'm opposed to the the Jews who I believe are involved in this, these conspiracies, yeah. right? That's the language that we get into when we start to talk about these sorts of things and sort of mutatis mutandis for um, UK anti-Semitism. Um, when Miliband was labor leader, there were all sorts of attacks on him that were fairly clearly anti-Semitic, but were sort of brushed off as, oh no, there are Jewish Tories, so there can't be um, Tory campaign anti-Semitism, yeah. that would never happen. Um, the, the gender criticals always do this. They have their like five yeah. trans people who are gender critical and then say, right. well, we're not transphobic because I like five of you. <laughs> right. So, Billy, interestingly, one of her uh, points of contention with other people in the movement is that her thing is like no good trans woman. Um, she has a piece called like deconstructing the good trans woman, I think, um, that's like these people should not be participants in the movement um the, and, and, yeah. yeah to be honest there is actually a whole strain of gender critical that does that i mean even the ones that will publicly support lots of the like good trans ones um they'll still be absolutely disgusting to them even like in a, just a different public forum like they'll they'll big them up on twitter and say oh i love your work and then they'll go to spinster and say like this disgusting man shouldn't be around children that kind of thing right. so um yeah that's quite um, common. So then I want to come back to, just to mention this um, the explicitly anti-Semitic um, book about the trans lobby. Um, and with, with regards to the on-ramping stuff, um, there was this striking post from over at their Reddit replacement um, after they got kicked off Reddit, um, where someone was talking about this book um, and someone else said that they looked at it and it was <laughs> very anti-Semitic. Um, and the other person would say, oh yeah, but the research is good. And so you can just kind of roll your eyes at those parts. Um, but the book is written to argue that this is a Jewish conspiracy, right? The, <laughs> the information is chosen to support the thesis. Um, and this idea that you can read it for the research and then just dismiss the, <laughs> you're just like drinking up everything but the the main con like conclusion. And it's not even everything but the main conclusion because it's like, it's just not the words of the main conclusion, right? You believe that there is this conspiracy involving all these particular people um, and just start. Who happen to be Jewish, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you, you still keep the names of all of those people, right? You're still gonna, the, the, the people that you're invoking as the conspirators are still going to be overwhelmingly and disproportionately Jewish. Right. I mean, it's still going to be Soros and Pritzker yeah, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Right. It's so it's, oh, they just happen. Right. And, and this is one way that certain on ramping gets built. Right. The, the sort of infrastructure of, of on ramping to these outlets get gets built. I mean, one thing that we that that has come up and um, we wanted to talk about a little bit was uh, Billick's invocation of David Icke, um, who is a pretty transparent anti-Semite on a few levels. Um, but uh, I mean, some people have noted that even that there's a, a really a couple of really interesting articles arguing that the lizard people theory stuff is all actually veiled um, loose metaphorical anti-Semitism anyway. 
But um, even if you set that aside, he's fairly explicit um, anti-Semite, right? He believes that there's a small cabal of Jews who are responsible for orchestrating the First World War and the Second World War, right? I mean, this, these are views right. that he, he has um, quite clearly laid out. I mean, he, he also believes that the, the protocols of the elders of Zion is true, though he thinks that it's about lizard people and not Jews. So there, there's, there's some fairly explicit stuff around people like Ike. Um, and it's not really an accident that someone um, who comes by that winds up endorsing um, these conspiracy theories that center Jewish actors. Right, I mean, that's a big part of what's going on. Yeah, so I think like one of the things that's striking is um, here with, one of the times she's sharing this, um, David Icke, um, is there an agenda behind the transgender ideology? Uh, which is, uh, as she says um, here, this dude has mapped everything. It took me eons to research. It's quite similar to her view. It's like there's this, um, conspiracy to merge from transgender people to transhumanism and also take away men's sperm, like you slow their sperm count, not physically take their sperm. Um, but yeah, then she- Some trans says, women are definitely it. taking away men's sperm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I no longer think it's the least bit implausible that there is AI driving this shit show, driving all of us. And she says, indeed, Ike says as much devil slash AI slash reptilian race. Uh, and so when you have this thing where it's like someone driving all of us, maybe it's lizards, maybe it's AI, maybe it's the devil. It, we know it's not thing, AI so the, because when Microsoft made an AI, it became anti-Semitic in 24 hours. So like, well, it's they, not they, an fed AI. It off the, they fed it off the internet, which is, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. going to happen. Um, <laughs> I, I should tell you, I mean, someone made a joke in the, I, I'm, I am paying attention to the chat, right? So, so someone in the chat was like, ooh, anti-Semitism on the internet. That's a lot of work. I was like, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, it's, it's serious. It's serious stuff. I mean, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, Ike stuff, um, it, it's not even really that you need the AI or lizard or any of that, right? I mean, Ike is someone who's quite happy to talk openly about um, the quote, um, Rothschild Zionist conspiracy, right? I mean, these are like, it, it's a mad libs of, of conspiracy theories, right? It's, it's just every possible permutation that you can get into, um, maybe minus the most um, explicit formulations, um, yeah. but but Ike is one of those people who has been a major um, major influencer in this movement for at, at least since the early '90s. Um, so I, I mean, between him and Glenn Beck, you, you have pretty clear framework <laughs> for what these movements look like in the U.S. and U.K. Uh, yeah, and I. Don't have any examples here, I'm seeing, but um, what I saw in these conversations where she was sharing this is that for many people, um, the lizard thing was a bridge too far. Um, the rest, which is like the conspiracy and stuff, what they were more amenable to, but so then that you just have this blank that something needs to go into. Um, and if I think for many people, like the, the goofy stuff, the goofy ways to fill in the blank, like it's the devil or it's reptilians, is it plausible? But then if you're looking for like a more human group to put in there um, behind the conspiracy, it's like a yeah. <laughs> obvious Yeah, one. so so I mean, so so some explicit examples, right? Um, right, uh, Illuminati and Brotherhood, he says, there's a go global Jewish clique uh, who worked with non-Jews to create the First World War, the Russian Revolution and the Second World War. Yikes. Right. I mean, this is and and actually the, the Russian Revolution claim in there might seem innocuous to some people, but the Russian Revolution claim is the backing of the protocols of the elders of Zion. That's fundamentally what the protocols is about. Um, it was published um, basically to suggest that the Jews created communism um, to overthrow Tsarist Russia. Right. I mean, that's the, the fundamental 
um, sort of underlying element of, of that. And so the fact that he believes the protocols are true is sort of directly tied um, to this, this claim about Jewish manipulation of uh, early 20th century history. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, these are, these are fairly straightforward. And um, when you have that historical view, right, when you adopt the historical view, all of a sudden you become much more credulous to the um, much more extreme conspiracy theories about the contemporary state, right? So if I think that, well, the, you know, this small clique of Jews created two world wars, then I'm much more inclined to think that, that they're steering legislation in contemporary- Yeah, they've done it before, trans- they yeah, can do it now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so on the on-ramping note, I'm going back a little, I guess. Um, so this was another thing that happened the day after um, we did the episode where we had talked, and I think this is a coincidence, and this is really, uh, we had talked about how Billick stuff was getting picked up by explicit Nazis, um, like the National Vanguard. Um, and then we were like, essentially, if you put the like um, Jennifer Pritzker's money along with other figures like fellow Jew and transsexual Martine Rothblatt, this, <laughs> suddenly it's like, the insertion of this one word is like yeah. right, such obvious Nazi stuff. Um, Julian Vigo, um, who is a writer um, who is on the UK side of things, um, she's on the um, more radical and like but like about the um kind of like full exclusionary side of things um she posted this piece um and in it um one of the pieces where she really would have um linked to but like she instead linked this national vanguard piece which i think is probably a mistake but um so i asked if like, anything about this website stood out and she said something about the pritzkers being instrumental uh, but like, if you are many people, this is an obvious Nazi website, right? Yeah, look at it's that like, top quote. Yeah, the yeah I was going to say, the, the tagline at the top. It's disgusting. You don't even need to go beyond that top line. Oh, disgusting. Toward, order, okay. like, toward so, a new consciousness, a new order, a new people. Um, so, so wait, this, um, so can you just go back to the other side of the screenshot? Actually, so, just a very, it's just a very old consciousness. So the, the article above here that that she posted from, oh, oh is, it, is that no, the Substack one? So who's, who's is that? This is hers. This she is Vigo's Substack. And so her Substack directly yeah. links, links to, that links to the grind. Germans yeah. weren't brutal enough. Okay, uh, well, so my the, goodness. So the news, it does change like which ones it's showing. So here it's showing race, race not country. country at the That's... Jew bomb. But it's, oh. not, it's not subtle. It's um, she, and she changed it eventually um, once it was pointed out. But I mean, you see that this were like, I think a person who hadn't, um, who didn't believe this stuff already that this is saying. Um, right. Yeah. But you yeah, don't you don't accidentally include an article from the National Vanguard like you... <laughs> well you do if what you're doing is you're pumping uh, Pritzkers and transgenderism into Google, hmm. which is what a lot of people do as the baseline for their research on this stuff, right? They see Billick and they say, "I'm gonna I want to learn more about this," so they punch it into Google and they just open links. I guess, and then so. the links that you're getting are sites like this, um, the book that that Chris and I were talking about, right? I mean, you get lots of this material that's, um, if you're not paying attention to say the fact that it says the Germans weren't brutal enough up at the top, right? And you're just scrolling down through the article um, might yeah, be I, compelling. And, and I suspect that's basically what happened with her link with Billick directly linking to Keith Woods, right? I mean, that's that's like, I didn't bother to look up this guy who is a source for this claim. And I didn't bother to see that he's, you know, mentioned with maybe one of the three most famous anti-Semites in the United States um, and maybe top five in the Anglophone world. 
right? I mean, Richard Spencer is not a fringe figure anymore, right? No. People yeah, know, but he's very mainstream. People know who he is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like Tommy Robinson was... in the UK. People know who that who that asshole is. Uh, so, yeah, I mean. So one of the things uh, I was thinking when I first saw this is like, I think if we're going on Joshua's trajectory, um, the stage where you are explicitly wondering about the Jewish aspect is far down. Um, but I think it's not necessarily um, at this stage where you are knowingly endorsing like this guy, um, like Richard Spencer. Um, and so I thought it was possible that she was not aware um, of these associations and would, you know, have the like, oh no, <laughs> um, response when seeing it. The, this person, um, she's talking to here, the, I guess, um, who knows what their avatar was when they had this conversation. Um, but the, yeah, the, the stuff where it's like, this, um, so this person is saying, um, you shouldn't have called these Jewish people white. Um, right. It's not subtle. <laughs> it's like pretty. Right. The guy with the the guy with the sun wheel and the SS bars on the face is like, yeah, yeah okay, that's that's an easy one. Um, but then also, um, we saw this week her response um, to this stuff on right. Twitter, um, and the response was not, oh no, like I have made a mistake in sharing this. Do you think? Do you think this is a response? Like to our podcast last week. Do you think this is? Um, I think episode? either the podcast or the um, Twitter the thread. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, it just the the rate at which she started this it's never been like this before. I think. Um, so soon after she posted, anti semite equals the new turf, um, which in this piece, this is an old piece she wrote, but um, are used like many of them. That turf is a slur that's used to discredit women. Um, the idea that anti-Semite is analogous to that is very troubling. Um, so one of the recent- Well, I think um, it is analogous in the sense in the sense that they're both accurate descriptions. <laughs> Though yeah. the, the F at the end of turf, maybe not so much. Um, but, but yeah. okay, go ahead, Katie. I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll um, I was just gonna say that this isn't actually the first time that I've seen this. There was one of the very recent gender critical crowdfunders uh, I'm not gonna explicitly say which one, but not, not the most recent Fair Play for Women one, but one of the next most recent ones, um, which was a, like a private one, in the comments there were several people who said exactly that, who said anti-Semite is a slur to uh, silence women, like this is their new thing instead of turf. Like I think there was a, maybe three comments, I highlighted them at the time, I, sh I should find them. But um, yeah, it's, it's it, like it's a thing. It's, it's not- This is a quite common thing, thing yeah. for sure. I mean, uh, look at any, someone does something that's sort of borderline anti-Semitic um, or maybe not explicit, but implicitly anti-Semitic, the first response when people say, hey, maybe don't say that, is uh, stop criticizing me, is stop calling me, or slurring me as an anti-Semite, right? So, I mean, that's been true. I'm sure it's it's been true at least as far back as anti-Semite has been recognized as a bad word, which is about the 1960s. Um, when when people really started more actively talking about um, anti-Semitism in the Holocaust. Um, yeah, so I've got, sorry, I found the quote here. Someone says, the newest slur to stop women speaking out in defense of our rights, dignity and safety is anti-Semite. We cannot allow our lives to be trashed in such a way. Oh, boy. yeah. Um, so and they the donated some money. They can like get a little mileage off the idea that turf is a slur for women in LA, and it's true that it's women who are radical feminists, and so originally women who were called um, TERFs in virtue of the radical feminism part, originally being a substantive part of what people meant when they said it. Um, it is false that most of the people accused of anti-Semitism are women. <laughs> that is totally possible. <laughs> it's just wacko. Um, but yeah, then um, this person, I think, is one of the um, gender critical people, the the non-major um, people who had criticized um, the anti-Semitism that um, we brought out. Um, and then she posted this new um, wacky chart of the Pritzker family funding. Um, this person says sarcastically, it's the Jews. 
Um, and Billy says, I hope that was a joke because it struck me as hilarious. Um, and it's just this general kind of like leaning in to it, I think. Um, and it's strange to be in part because Billy, I think, continues to be, um, so she's part of a circle in the US side of things um, that involves like um, partners for ethical care. Um, this is on Wednesday, we're upping her. Um, Kara Dansky of Wolf, um, and now they're doing, um, on Monday, the Women Picket um, DC, which at least at the beginning, she was being tagged as though she was a main part of. Um, and to me, this doesn't read as though people um, who are close to her in organizing stuff have spoken to her and been like, this is a problem. <laughs> you need to like back off this stuff. Um, it, yeah, it, it's like going full steam ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was a little surprised. So when the when the group that she was supposed to be speaking at that where she's now no longer speaking, which we talked about at the top a little bit, um, when they said, oh, she pulled out because of family issues, my first response was, and I literally responded on Twitter with this, is why is it that she's pulling out due to family issues rather than because she's doing all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, like, over. right. So either someone has either 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 someone said it and they're just not advertising it because they don't want to alienate people who agree with Belik, or they are sort of, um, or it maybe it's a genuine family family issue and they didn't have a problem with the fact that she's openly anti-Semitic, which. Uh, strikes me as plausible, uh, disturbingly plausible in this sort of case. If I mean, the idea, okay, so so I do want to pivot on something Krista said real quick, which is the, the idea that um, referring to someone as an anti-Semite is silencing. And, and this is true in the US, but it's especially common in the UK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's very, very common in the UK, especially in right-wing British politics. So probably the most famous... Uh, instance of this comes from um, comes around the Brexit campaign involving a um, fairly well known uh, top hat wearing dingus named uh, Jacob Rees Mogg, um, referring to a, a few of his Jewish colleagues uh, as Illuminati who are taking power to them the, the powers to themselves, um, and being criticized pretty robustly for the anti-Semitism implicit in the conspiracy theory alongside his various invocations of Soros and things like that, um, the same sort of tactic. And, and this, his response was basically, no, you can't, don't silence me, right? We should, you know, this is a legitimate yeah, thing to say. It, it's so common, um, like particularly in gender critical, but as soon as you get into anything, like all, any of the reactionary side of things to say homophobe is a slur to shut me down like you're trying to silence me by calling me a misogynist like transphobe is just to silence people like this it's the default thing that people say and i get it all the time online from it, like basically every group that i argue with um but particularly from gender critical people every single word that you say to describe anything that's happening is a slur to silence them um, mm -hmm. And it's like the default go-to position, I think, for a lot of people. As soon as you say transphobe, even in the most explicit cases, even when someone is threatening death on all trans people, they'll be like, oh, they, you call everything transphobe these days. It's just to silence people. Right. So, yeah, it's, it, and it's, I think it's roughly the same rhetorical pivot. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's the same. Well, I didn't quite say it the most obvious possible way, just in like the second most obvious possible way. So yeah, you're, you're overreacting and it's like, no, no. I mean, these are, these are fairly straightforward cases. And when we look at the on-ramping effects of these sorts of things, um, it, it is fairly straightforward. I mean, one of the, one of the things that will come up, right. And I think we'll see this more and more in the UK, um, gender critical movement, the GC movement, is that there will be more explicit anti-Semites involved, right? So, I mean, one of the things that came up recently was the, the uh, prospect of uh, protesting outside of um, mm. clinics that engage in these sort of gender-affirming 
medical procedures. Yeah, so this is right, just or, uh, the, uh, what it just was talking about is part, so Partners for Ethical Care, uh, which is this organization I was just talking about that has been um, continuing to boost Billick. Um, they are one of these um, US organizations that's in this kind of um, Kara Dansky, Joey Bright, Jennifer Billick sphere um, to my eye. <laughs> Um, and they have posted this release um, oh, where the contact is actually Joey Bright. Um, so they've posted this release that then um, Emma Harriet Nicholson has shared about how they're planning to protest um, outside of gender clinics. Um, Which is the same tactic lifted from the anti-abortion people protesting famous. outside of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think one, like, uh, so, discussing this where they have similar tactics to like the anti-abortion people and also discussing how people say anti-Semite is a slur to silence me or a way of silencing me. Like it kind of links into this thing that I often point out about like talking the root of transphobia onwards to anti-Semitism and other things is when I say like transphobia rots your brain. And I often think that it teaches you when, when you enter a, a new debate and you, you, have taken up the like transphobic side of things and everyone around you says transphobe is a slur to silence you it's okay when anyone says transphobe you can just ignore it and you can just tell them they're silencing you and right. once you learn that pattern of defense when you see the same thing happening in another sphere you see someone arguing with an anti-semite and the anti-semite says anti-semite is a slur to silence me you're like i recognize that pattern my brain has already learned how to Right. use this defense that. so i that it instantly makes you take the side of the person who's using the same strategies as you and then so you're just much more likely to when you don't know what's going on you see two people arguing one of them says you're sil silencing me with a slur and the other one says you're a bigot then you just take the side of the bigot and it's the same with this like once you're already used to the idea of protesting outside parent parenthood because they help trans kids then you know the idea that people are protesting outside for abortion at least you're you're not going to be, you're not going to start supporting bans of protesters outside abortion clinics because you're like well if they ban them they'll ban us so we should all be allowed to protest and then you know right. it, it, you start making excuses for people and you end yeah. up backing people up even if you don't necessarily agree with their positions yeah so i i mean the th i have a lot of experience with the anti-abortion movement and um in the u.s and the hopefully their, against it <laughs> yeah um yeah <laughs> and um look they have a, a lot of this tie into the right wing anti-semitism sphere um that that sort of tracks i think fairly closely with this i have a slideshow which i won't go into here because frankly I, I'm looking at the comments in, in the sidebar and, and I don't want to distress people more than they already have. But, you know, they, they, they have conspiracy theories about how um, Soros and the Rothschilds are harvesting embryos to, um, you know, develop a pattern towards immortality, right? So that should sound familiar based on Billick. Um, similarly, you know, that they tend to correlate very closely with um, the cultural conservative environment of the U.S., which is white and evangelical, um, largely, um, that has fairly explicit racist and anti-Semitic overtones um, that going back to at least the late 19th century, um, but certainly picked up more actively um, during the Nixon years and eventually the Reagan years. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that this is... Um, if I were looking for an analogy in the way that I see that movement patterning itself, the GC movement patterning itself, it would be the American anti-abortion movement circa 1985, right? And, and sort of, you're gonna have these Pat Buchanan type figures who are openly anti-Semitic and they're sort of shunted to the side, but they have their own following and they have the people who are into it. And then you have the bulk who recognize the dog whistles but think that that's not anti-Semitism, right? We'll say, oh no, we're not anti-Semitic. That's a slur to silence us. Um, you know, we're not like those fringe guys over there, like the Buchanans and the John Birchers and all that stuff, right? We are like, um, 
you know, we're the reasonable advocates, even though they're engaged in the same tropes and they're actively on-ramping people towards that neo-Nazi side of the movement, um, that white supremacist side of the movement. Yes, I think Joshua was uh, referring to this kind of, one of the things we see um, with Billick are these accusations of um, very serious kind of towards children in particular. Um, so what she's referring to is um, well, like adolescents really um, getting trans health care. Um, but then she's saying children are being used as pawns in a huge eugenics experiment. Um, they're driving this into grade schools, get the next generation hooked young, they'll go like lambs to the slaughter. Um, it's a eugenics experiment, children are the fodder. Um, you see, this is like um, standard gender critical rhetoric, talking about trans healthcare being eugenics or Nazis or something like that's. I, I see that every single day from rank and file people. So that's, that's yeah, obviously it, a more acceptable idea. And so, if yeah. you're like me and you grew up in the US um, when pre-gay marriage, right? You remember this talk about child predation and the relation between um, gay rights and you know sexual abuse, yeah. Um, and, and and so that same historically, in the UK. same in the UK, I'm sure. Um, so those sorts of things developed in a very very particular way. Um, in those cases, people also should keep in mind that there was an anti-Semitic conspiracy backing for a lot of that also on the far right. So when I mentioned Pat Buchanan or Elizabeth Dilling, right, it was that same sort of thing. It was. Um, we talk about the quote culture wars unquote, but the the idea of the culture wars was it was sort of a um, a white evangelical boogeyman of um, homosexuality, um, communism, Abortion. any non any vaguely non Christian religion, right? Those were sort of the things that were the specter here, yeah. um, and and stories like that frequently needed a puppet master, and given the historical tropes. Jews became sort of the easy go-to there. Um, that was true during the Red Scare in the 50s. I mean, Henry Ford in the 1920s was saying that the Jews invented jazz to corrupt <laughs> the minds of young white children. I heard that. <laughs> and, as, and as much as I would like to uh, take, I would like my people to be able to take credit, um, black people invented jazz. That's, they get that one. So, um, but that was the sort of thing, right? I mean, this idea of child predation as sort of, and corrupting the young uh, and destroying the young as sort of a, a way of talking about um, both as a way of motivating people to be more actively involved and eventually as a justification for violence is very common because when you talk about people hurting kids, yeah, people get so people angry. Get violent. Yeah, people sure. get violent. I mean, yeah. it's that's just how it is. I mean, and I'm sure all of us have had those sorts of visceral reactions when we see stories about you know child abuse or child sexual abuse or anything like that. Right, the immediate reactions are maybe uh, not the are not the most tame. Right, they can be visceral and yeah. angry and and justifiably. And so when you hear this sort of language, you think, okay, now they're setting up a pretext for bombing something or yeah, shooting Yeah, or someone. getting violent uh, and, or, and or even just arresting people. I think sometimes, like, you know, they want to yeah. push for that. I've seen uh, quite major gender critical people discussing how they think, you know, the trans, the males at the helm should be put in jail and things, so. Right, um, and, and one of the things that, I, th I, I mean, when I mentioned that I think the analog is the American anti-abortion movements in the, in the 70s, um, that's where I see this going, right? I mean, they're talking about the, the, the movement got really violent in the 80s when they started talking about killing babies. When the rhetoric pivoted from the technical term abortion or the naming of the procedures to talking yeah. about killing babies, things got bloody. Fast. They've like in gender critical, they they've completely or you know dropped any kind of pretense of science, and it's always about mutilating children or right. sterilizing children, or, right. or usually both. Um, 
and you know it's a way of like separating out making it more like a sound more like a crazy evil process that you couldn't possibly object to and obviously no one wants to mutilate children no one wants to kill babies and that just isn't what's happening so right yeah yeah, yeah think, so yeah so i think that's a kind of two classic anti-semitic conspiracies that seem like they're kind of at play and so the stuff you said joshua uh, one of them being just like the blood libel one where it's like jewish people are killing um children to make matzah um and that and with this it's like it's just a really effective um way of making them like not human anymore like Katie said, like, no one wants to hurt children. Um, and so then when we're hearing that these people are butchering children, um, it's like, what is happening here? Um, you start going down this weird route. Um, and and they, are, they always ask me the, like, the question, they're like, so, Katie, do you support mutilating children? And like, and then I'll start, you know, I'll say, well, obviously trans healthcare isn't mutilation. It's completely ridiculous. And they're like, yes or no? And like, well, no, I don't support mutilating children. But I support trans healthcare because they're completely right, they're not the same thing. polar opposite concepts. So right. fuck off. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the the blood libel stuff is really tricky because there's a long history of it and it has a bunch of different forms, right? So the the classic version is sort of um, kidnapping and ritual murder, right? This is the the version that comes about in the 17th century, um, probably earlier, but we have a bunch of recorded cases in the 17th century. Um, um, recorded most, cases of people making the making the allegation, um, and and Jewish communities basically being rounded up and killed because of the allegation, mostly in the UK. Um, oh God. Interestingly, uh, but the so the 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 challenge is that over time that evolves. So we've gotten um, Jews are responsible for har harvesting organs. Um, uh, kidnapping people to harvest organs. That was a very popular one with Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam for a long time. Um, it still occasionally gets picked up in certain very right-wing reactionary um, Arab language outlets, but it, it, it's uh, not so popular in the West. Um, the um, more common stuff ha has been, uh, ha has come up around sort of Jewish child murder and um, well poisoning and things like that um, during the during the later half of the 20th century. So I mean, these are the sorts of cases that are, um, there's a there's definitely something here. And again, this is an area where um, we'll see a lot of emphasis on Jewish doctors, right? Where you'll see the patterning there become very clear. And in a lot of those cases, you know, it's not so surprising. I mean. Jewish people like uh, South Asian people disproportionately go into medical fields, um, go, go in at a, higher, at a higher rate than their white counterparts. And um, so it's not that surprising that there are more of them there. Uh, also the ones who go to medical school tend to be more liberal, right? And so they tend to be um, more in, inclined to participate in um, LGBTQ affirming care. When, when right. one half of the political spectrum uh, thinks that you're coming after children and the other half is listening and saying anti-Semitism is bad, like, which way do you think most Jewish people are going to go? Like, I, always, I always think this when they say, like, oh, LGBT people are all crazy leftists. Like, there must be something, there must be a mental illness or something, like, the left is all... It's like, well, maybe it's because your side of the political spectrum mm. makes life hard for them. And if you didn't, <laughs> then it would be an even split. Um, yeah. Like it's just such a, a, like, if I looked and I thought, oh, my side of the political spectrum has almost no people of type X, then maybe it's not good for them. I don't know. Just like, think about it. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, I'm not going to speak for the black community, obviously, but I mean, lots of people will point out, you say, well, why, why are black people Democrat, overwhelmingly Democrats in the United States? Well, Partly because they're the party that doesn't have issues with constantly saying racist stuff. Well, less issues. Right? <laughs> Fewer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so bad. Um, but so similarly, I mean, uh, uh, people talk about um, Jews in, in the Tory party in the UK, right? I mean, there's a reason why a lot of Jewish people left the Tory party in the UK. I mean, it, similar, uh, there were obviously problems with Corbyn, um, but preceding Corbyn, the, the Labour Party had a Jewish leader, 
right? Um, I, which has not been super common in the UK. Um, it's, it's very rare in the US though. Uh, it happens to be the case for the Democrats at the moment. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, it, it, it is true that just on a, on a statistical level, these things tend to break down pretty straightforwardly where minorities move to the area where they're least likely to face hostility. Um, <laughs> yeah, for good, for obviously good reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah. Uh, we're over, but yeah. uh, a second, <laughs> the, I think like a second classic anti-Jewish conspiracy of the um, is this like idea that um, Jewish people are trying to like, undermine society um, and they destabilize whatever makes the society work in order to advance something. Um, and the what we get from Billick um, is very much these accusations of destabilizing like, all of society um, and leading to this kind of social apocalypse. Um, where am I going? Uh, yeah, uh, this has zero to do with identity. It is quickly going to destabilize civilization. Um, People better start asking why the abolishment of sex under the guise of gender identity is being forced into Western cultures at warp speed. Um, they always go on about this ab abolition of sex or whatever, and it's just such a ridiculous straw man of what trans people are asking for. Um, yeah. You know, like the legal concept of sex being abolished. Uh, um, she responds to someone saying that in California, there's a whiff of eugenics and says a whiff, the stench has permeated it permeated the entire Western world. This is a global affair, transgenderism into the market. Good luck getting out. Um, so this, um, someone else, she replies, um, it's most of them in Western society. It's happened simultaneously and it's a blitzkrieg meant to norm normalize a monstrous ideology. So you have this kind of idea that there is this mass uh, conspiracy to undermine society um, there's like this crisis rhetoric that is like, she said that um, if we don't stop this, there'll be nothing left. Um, overall, <laughs> I think a lot of things that we see from um, like the logic of extreme anti-Semitism, where it's Jewish people as this existential threat to society um, that are kind of like toxic um, and that need to be like push out less society be undermined um and then so i think it's both natural that it goes into anti-semitism um people who accept this are inclined to accept it it's also worth emphasizing that if we have a ideology here um that is that has the same logic as anti-semitism but doesn't come home to roost on jewish people and instead just comes down to trans people it remains extremely concerning. The, yeah. the way that cynicism works is dark and very scary. Um, I think my is that like with Billick, um, her stance towards trans people I think is eliminationist. It's not at this point genocidal in that um, she does not think of like, the key element I think is missing is that um, she doesn't conceive this as a intrinsic feature of trans people. Um, so the path forward to this thing that she um, presents as something that like, society needs to be rid of is not allowing people to um, transition anymore. Um, we have this article um, where she says, um, like, the argument is that people should be able to make up their own minds. And she says, but why? Why should they do it when these changes come at great cost to society? Um, so you have this kind of picture that is, it's not what, only- what's, What cost to society is she proposing? Um, so the problem she says is that um, other people want to live in a world that's ordered to the natural. Um, oh, I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the nature argument. Boundaries that um, attempt to deconstruct the boundaries that make us as sexually dimorphic um, 
species. Interestingly, um, she mentions other people are focused on um, sort of the danger to women. She says danger is a secondary, they're not inconsequential issue. Boundaries are important for structure over chaos, for privacy, for safety, and for wholeness. Why is respect for the boundary of sex being eroded and coded into law? So um, it's, it's full on like, it's, it's pretty much one step away from going against God's plan. Like, yeah, so, so I want to pick up on one thing that Krista said here, right, which is that it's not quite full eugenics, yeah. because I actually think that this is one of the areas that's a little trickier. Um, there is a, a sort of standard definition of eugenics of packing people in cattle mm -hmm. cars and that kind of stuff. It's but not there's also, right, right, right. So that's sort of the conventional understanding of, you know, if you're talking about Rwanda, if you're talking about the Holocaust, if you're talking about the Armenian genocide, um, or what's happening to the Uyghurs, right? That's um, all pretty conventional in, in genocidal terms. But there's also genocide by cultural obliteration, right? So um, morally the ideas... mandating trans people out of existence. Yes. Right. So when we when we talk, I mean, I'm living in Canada right now. In Canada, one of the most ongoing points of discussion is over the role of um, the residential school system, um, which was basically an attempt to remove ind indigenous culture, an intentional attempt to remove indigenous culture completely by taking kids out of indigenous communities and teaching them in um, white schooling environments. Now, these were also environments endemic with abuse and death, and there was lots of murdering and stuff going on there too. But even if it hadn't been that been like that, the idea of obliterating the culture is itself, and the idea of obliterating that kind of identity is itself a form of genocide. And this is something I talk about in the context of anti-Semitism a lot because uh, Christian and other sorts of religious groups that believe in um, converting everyone are ultimately dedicated to the obliteration of all of those other cultures, right? Whether they're, I mean, Ju Judaism happens to be mine and it happens to be one that's sort of locally involved, but um, that, that comes up a lot, but um, it, it can also be Hindus and Sikhs and um, Muslims and so on, right? These other groups that would be by necessity um, subsumed. And so I think that, that when we talk about what Billick is doing, at the very least, what she's talking about is um, making it the case that there are no trans people. Yeah. Right. So, I, I mean, that, even if we're not going to talk about it in the sort of mass murder mode of genocide of a Rwanda or a Cambodia, so, though I do have worries that she is kind of looking in that direction sometimes. Yeah. The, I mean, um, the problem, right, is that like, if the key thing you're missing is um, if you have the like level where it's like, these people are toxic to society. They're an existential threat. Um, but you don't have the piece that's like, they are essentially like this. Um, it's like, and instead you're going like the forced assimilationist route, but it's a feature of people that in fact is persistent of them. It's scary, right? So it's not, it makes it like not on its face. Right. One, it murders, it's like, where are we going? One <laughs> difference is that um, most people believe that you know, like being Jewish is something inherent, I guess, uh, certainly yeah. like being Jewish right. um, genetically, uh, whereas pretty key to the gender critical movement is the fact that being trans isn't. Like it's right. a social disease, it's something you can catch. It isn't inherent to people. So I guess that's that divides. Well, this is sort there. of an interesting analog actually, because in a lot of the Christian supremacist circles, Right, the idea of active conversion of all the um, of Jewish people or indigenous people, whatever, is the idea that while the the quote racial unquote identity might be um, intrinsic, the religious identity isn't. Right. Yeah. For and sure. So that can actually be um, eradicated. Destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's sort of that's one of the areas where we get into this. Um, uh, Liz Brunig, who some people like, but I really don't, wrote a piece defending the mission system in California, 
um, and basically um, was sort of ignored this dimension of it, very selectively right. um, tuned out this dimension that um, the forced conversion of indigenous people, while it didn't involve killing all of them, though it did involve enslaving them, um, it, it didn't involve killing all of them, it did involve destroying their culture, right? It, it, so, I mean, in, in that sense, it, there is this attempt to separate out certain parts of, um, certain parts of identity, which um, individuals don't view as um, changeable, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think being Jewish is really something I can change. Um, and obviously, I mean, that's different than gender identity, right? That's different from my queerness, but um, it has that same sort of element in that I recognize that lots of people external to me think it is, right? Think it is something that I can change, right? If I, if I were just in the right conversion therapy, whether, re, you know, religious yeah. conversion or gender or whatever, then that would be, then it would all go back to, everything would be white as rain, Yeah. right? I mean, that's... So on on uh, genocide, like you're saying about the sort of the definition about whether it's a really extreme version, I've just remembered there's like a UN definition of genocide and I looked up. So there's um, five parts to it. There's killing members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group, deliberately inflict inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another. And like, that is like, I think it's quite easy to say some of the actions of the gender critical movement are intending those things or actively doing those things to trans people, like causing serious bodily and mental harm to the members of the group. When you're campaigning to shut down all trans healthcare and right. the trans healthcare is already at an absolute state and you're trying to ban it from children when we know for a fact that it will cause them serious harm at, for the rest of their lives. Um, right. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like you say, it's not putting people in cattle trucks and sending them to concentration camps, but it's, um, or, you know, it, it's definitely arguably on this list and certainly like transferring children from one group to another when they managed to ban trans healthcare for under 16s in the UK. And then all of the parents were obviously panicking because their children's lives were suddenly turned upside down and no one cared. That, so right. then then when they were posting on Twitter saying, oh, is there any way around this? Then they were reporting them all to social services and that like, we need to take these children away and give them to like families who can bring them up properly. Um, so I don't know, there is some overlap for sure. And if you were to say gender critical people want a trans genocide, they'd be like, you think we want to send you to concentration camps? That's bullshit. And then they can, you know, say you're ridiculous, but... It does at least partially in some places overlap with the UN definition for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's. I mean, one of the things that's tricky is the definitions of genocide are focused on um, ra racial ethnic classification, yes. yeah. right? So it doesn't really work in the sense that um, you're not talking about discrete groups, right? So. Um, the forced sterilization elements, for example. Well, that is one really trans people did have. Uh, like yeah, lots of country have them still. But because today. we're not talking about heritability. Yes, yeah. Right, it's not quite it's the, not same. the same. Not quite right? the same. Right, we're, we're, we are talking about sterilization in the sense that people want to forcibly sterilize trans people. Mm. But we're not talking about it in the sense that, that, that that's a means. In order to prevent more. To so prevent the creation of more trans yeah. people, because that's not how trans people happen. Though I have right? seen like, people saying that before, so. <laughs> it was a weird theory for a long time about um, male homosexuality. Yeah. Um, I think in the 50s yeah. that some people thought that, that that was how gay kids were born. Um, when two gay men have a gay sex, then a gay uh, kid is born. Yeah, I guess so. Um, uh, yeah, just on the... On the genocide note. Uh, <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> yeah, I introduced that a little at the wrong bit. <laughs> Yeah, I guess something like, I think is important about um, Philly, and I also want to, like, this is obviously like, very scary. Um, and I think there is, it's worth distinguishing between, like, uh, an ideology being the kind of one that 
if it um, became like enforced would be like, very serious. Um, and it being like, we have the cultural conditions that that is likely to happen, which like, I, I, the, what has been in, implemented in the UK is very disturbing. I think if we look at these policies, um, like do you think in general, we're like, what are they doing? It's just control of trans people, right? It's like yeah. just forcing trans people to, I mean, the, the census thing, if, if we're trying to like, what is the goal of this? Why, why is it so important to them that trans people mark um, like their birth sex on their- Which they never birth. will. It will uh, never happen. There's no way yeah. they could change it to do that, but yeah. Um, when they can get the data with either, um, it's just like a degradation control thing. It's and asserting like, dominance. That's what this whole thing is. It's, we can raise loads of money. We can sue the government and make them change the law just to make trans people's lives worse, which is what they just did with this changing the standard gender neutral language to explicitly gendered language just to exclude trans men. No one gained any, literally no one benefited at all in any way. And trans men didn't even lose out that much because we would never going to have a trans politician in the UK anyway and it only affected them and so on. But it was an assertion of dominance. It was saying, we have the power to change the laws to make things harder for you. At, like, and no one gains anything. So I think it's... um. Yeah, quite important for them to do that. I think assertion of dominance and just like infliction of pain, yeah. right? They, yeah, um, it's malicious on purpose, really. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but I think um, really, it, her ideology is extreme among um, people, especially in that um, the no good trans women thing um, is right. extreme. And, and the, because the mainstream position is that Trans women um, should have to constantly live um, in ways where they are telling people they're- They want what they have in Hungary. They just want you to have like a marker so that everyone knows you're trans at all times. And then you want to be forbidden from spaces you need to live. Yeah, the history of of, of those sorts of markers is maybe- Well, like this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So Um, I I mean- can I read this? The, um, yeah. Yeah, read this the last of the disturbing pillow tweets this week. Um, she says, I do believe that big pharma handmaiden stars should be supplied to all people who discuss gender identity while ignoring the corporatism behind it. Any design suggestions? And someone says, a star with a Lupron symbol. I don't think that is a symbol, um, but the- <laughs> Yeah, I was like, what, what do you mean the chemical symbol? Everyone's gonna recognize the chemical <laughs> symbol for Lupron, I don't think so. But yeah, yeah this, uh, so, this so I guess I was just gonna say handmaiden generally in gender critical speech means cis women who don't oppose trans rights. But here right. I guess it's big pharma handmaidens, which is, it's probably what she means. Um, it, it weird to, pick women in particular but most people who support trans rights are women so yeah this is i i I tried to read this as like i was like when i saw this i was like this is like a nazi thing and i tried to it was like can i read this as like a sarcastic you should give them gold stars and my conclusion was no i cannot no i I think it's quite design suggestions it's just like it's (laughs) <laughs> right it, it it doesn't it, it fails the 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 ability to be charitably interpreted as not wildly bigoted yeah right it's just it's you, you can look for those charitable interpretations but i don't think you can f- find any that are plausible yeah i mean the, yeah, the classic or at least i can't the classic like outright thing to do is say something that's obviously racist but has another interpretation that arguably they could have said but either this has failed or this isn't tried to do that yeah well, someone, was, someone was asking me uh, I, I i think uh krista and, and i have talked about this because krista's in phil language and things like that um, there's a very, there's a famous, really excellent article on dog whistles by Jennifer Saul, who's a British philosopher. And um, one of the points that um, comes up in a lot of these discussions is that dog whistles have to change a lot over time, especially when you have like super saturated environments. Yeah. Because 
you lose the plausible deniability that's the whole point of having the dog whistle in the first place. So, so that's something I, I actually asked on Twitter today, and it's interesting you bring it up. So there was a new one today, which was super straight and super gay. I yeah, don't know if you saw oh, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 this is the context. Absolute joke. Yeah. Um, and it, they're trying to conjure up some way of saying I'm not attracted to trans people, um, which which is a ridiculous claim. It's like saying I'm not attracted to left-handed people. But... Right. Um, like I was saying, like why do they, why they have so many dog whistles? Why do they need another one? Like what's the? But I guess it's because, like, they you know people start learning them. Yeah. They start, and, well, and, 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 and uh, our mutual friend Veronica Ivy, I think, made the same point that I did, which is, yeah, I mean, if you say the same thing over and over and over again, um, and there's lots of public discussion about whether or not what you said was bigoted eventually the public is going to pick up on this. So the, the example that I often use when I talk to people is the Soros stuff, which is still in, in wide circulation, especially on the right in both the US and UK. But um, when it started, it was a really, really effective dog whistle. When Glenn Beck was on Fox News and he was doing this stuff in the, in the late aughts, um, it, was, it really worked. Yeah. Um, and then it sort of became oversaturated and yeah, it there becomes were mass an ironic meme. Yeah. Yeah. There were, there were mass shootings where people were using the dog whistle and things like that. I mean, same with cultural Marxism, right? Which is, which is one of those cases that comes up and it's been used by, um, I mean, among others, Suella Braverman, who's a UK, she was an MP. I think she's now the attorney general of Wales or something crazy like that. Um, or whatever the official position title is. Mm. Um, th those sorts of things come up on a fairly regular basis. And over time, as people learn the conventions, it loses this effect because it, the, the entire purpose of a dog whistle is that people listening in the regular register can't hear it. I, I right? just think one thing that I think is interesting, and I guess maybe this isn't quite a dog whistle, but how um, like PC gone mad like turned into SJW, turned into woke. And they all just mean the same right. thing. And we're having all the same arguments right. about the same things for the same reasons. And I just think, why? Like, why aren't you saying PC still? Why aren't you saying SJW still? And I guess because people do generally think, like they realize that PC gone mad is nonsense. And then they like, oh, SJWs though, that's something new. I hate them instead. And it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating that people are that. Right. Dim, but. <laughs> and it's all just code for why can't I say the N word more often? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Like, and 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 keep my job, right? I mean, these are the the reality for for that sort of conversation is that, like you said, the terminology has changed, but the content is exactly the same, right? And the 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 sort of rebrand of gender critical is, I think, going to that's absolutely one. Yeah, it's absolutely. going to go the same way, right? It's it's. Um, and gonna... we saw it in the U.S. with the far right. They had to go from, um, you know, they had to go from uh, nationalist, right, from ethno-nationalist to alt-right to whatever, you know, they're, now there are a yeah. handful of terms that are sort of competing for that. I think... Um, I though think... some people are trying to bring nationalist, just general nationalist back. I think um, that... Like, um... The schism for gender critical has begun. Um, I think it started last year. I think I, I don't know. I want to say it might be this year, but it might be next year. It, it's like this is the year that I think America and the like reactionary right in America gets involved in like gender critical language, and it's when it will hit the super mainstream, um, which is scary. But I I know that already there are like the radical feminist side of gender critical is already starting to disown the label gender critical because it associates you with people like Posey Parker and, um, you know, Jennifer Billick and stuff who fall under this gender critical label and who just aren't feminists. Um, right. And so, the, you know, the, the original, like the true TERFs, as I might call them, who got rid of the label TERF, created a new label, brought in a load of reactionary idiots and they're now trying to leave it. They'll be the first, but there'll be other people because... You know, as people start learning that gender critical is garbage, um, yeah, they'll just have to leave it and they'll have to come up with a new term. So, we can yeah, I mean, I, I don't know realist. what the trajectory. Yeah, I don't know what the what the the trajectory in the U.S. is. I suspect Krista has a better handle on this than I do. 
but it's still kind of hard to tell. But the reactionary right wing groups that are taking sorry. The reactionary right groups that are taking this stuff up, I mean, Krista and I have talked about um, AC PEDS, right? The American College of Pediatricians, which is just a hate group. I mean, they're yeah. just, they've been a homophobic and anti Semitic hate group for a long time. Um, and now they have happened to have made transphobia their brand, yeah. right? And that's the same thing with groups like the Family Research Council which was an, a homophobic hate group here for a long time and focus on the family, right? All of these groups are going to pivot because they figure, right. Cause they figure, well, we lost the, you know, it's no longer tolerable to be homophobic. So it's, we need to do something. It's partly because they like, they lost, but also it's a, it's a wedge issue for them to win back. Like right. homophobia in the UK is rising. Like there's been more homophobic hate crimes in like every year on year for the last few years. And it's because of, transphobia like they're always linked transphobia and homophobia and biphobia it all goes together it's the same pressures from the same people and so when when transphobia it's when trans people suddenly debate it's like this transphobia rots your brain thing once you realize that you can say oh you know being trans isn't a thing it's a choice you're born with gender dysphoria but that's you you don't have to deal with it that way we can give you therapy to cure it once you've accepted that idea, the idea that being gay isn't a thing, it's a choice and you're born with homosexual urges and we can give you therapy to cure it. It's just like one step away. Right. It's, and it's, not, it's not an accident that the groups that were running conversion therapy camps for gay kids are yeah. now push the same ones, right? AC PEDS is one of those groups, right? Yeah. It was like a major cons- conversion therapy pusher and is like, oh, now it's just conversion therapy, but trans. Yeah, but right. We can't, it's like this same, same, but different. They've renamed right? it like it's gender critical therapy now. Um, right. Because conversion therapy has a bad, uh, and also like, so conversion therapy has a bad reputation. So it's the shifting dog whistle thing because conversion therapy itself is like a dog whistle for what they really want uh, or not a dog whistle or euphemism. But also they, they're kind of still trying this being trans is conversion therapy angle. Um, so I, I think that this is where the US and the UK are going to kind of clash in that the UK is still trying to do this trans people hurt gay people thing. And I don't think mm-hmm. the US is going to do that because most of the US people who are opposing trans rights are very explicitly not on board with gay rights. So right. I think that that line will be, a, there'll be some internal clashes in gender critical, but I do think it's just going to go away. And um, Right. And it'll just be the, it'll just be the right. Yeah. 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 I think it's something they, I think they're finding the guise of feminism um, more friendly than yes. I'm yeah. Um, yeah. Like um, Candace Owens called Donald Trump a feminist for saying sex based rights or whatever on stage. <laughs> like Donald Trump, the ultimate feminist. <laughs> Beyond well, the joke. I mean, can, Candace Owens too is. Yeah. Um, oh have we done gosh. all the slides, by the way? Um, yeah. Uh, we've kind of bounced around. Yeah. yeah. So what is, what is, I just want to like I think what she's doing here is like the alt right thing where you um, like are, she's like semi trolling I think I but it's like trolling with not very good stuff. at it though like she needs to get in some four chan people to do it for her, I think <laughs> but she should not to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah okay. I think we're good on um, okay so. Um, I don't know how you two are doing for time. We, we've gone quite over. I don't, I don't have anywhere to be. Okay, well, because I, I can say if you two both have still energy, then I can ask the chat if they have any questions. Yeah, well, fine. there's one in the chat that I saw. Okay, so, so can I just um, say quickly before you start? So if anyone in the chat has questions, please can you tag me so that it um, flashes up so we can say it and ask questions quick because we probably won't get through all of them. So anyway, go for it, Josh. You saw a question already. Yeah, so, so someone asks... Um, Right. Much of anti-Semitism in GC discourse seems to be economic. Do you think this is underpinned uh, by under other forms of racism like religious and racial? So this is a great question and it lets me talk about my actual research on this stuff. So I actually think that there are three kind of partially overlapping versions of anti-Semitism. Um, there's sort of the classical religious, um, there's the racial stuff, and then there's the conspiracy theory driven stuff. Um, so I don't really think there's properly an anti Semitic um, economic anti Semitism. I think the conspiracy theory stuff 
tends to be um, driven by people who are wealthy, um, Jews who are wealthy, because um, they're the people who are plausibly conspirators, right? So people who have economic power are more plausible conspirators than like people like me who are broke grad students, right? Like th For th now, there's a difference until you get your secret Jewish funding. Well, eventually, <laughs> eventually, I'll become part of the acad the academic um, cabal, yeah, yeah. right? But the, the the idea is is something like um, uh, there's a sort of um, uh, insofar as there's an economic dimension to it that focuses on wealth, it tends to focus on wealth because they're prominent figures and because um, follow the money is a common mode of conspiracy theories, right? So, um, and we see that with Billick, we saw that with the pseudonymous uh, Soros is astroturfing trans rights stuff, um, which, uh, as far as I know, comes from uh, Kelly uh, Sadler, who uh, was originally Kelly Riddle, her maiden name, um, who, was, when she was writing for the Washington Times, and she went on to work in the Trump administration um, in comms. Um, but she was the one pushing uh, trans rights as being astroturfed by the Jewish boogeyman, right, that, that in 2016. Um, so I think that it's, I think the conspiratorial dimension has some elements of this, right? So I think that um, the racial and religious dimensions also pivot on a general view that Jews are deserving of suspicion, um, that, that they're manipulative or um, plotting or something like this. Right, so um, when you look at the early Christian writings talking about how the Jews killed Jesus, right, a lot of the stuff is about Jewish character as manipulative um, or, and malicious. And so, and, and that sort of develops through the centuries. And then when you get into the development of the eugenics movement in the 19th century, um, that's made much more explicit. Um, so Caesar Lombroso, who's one of the founders of criminology, um, created, wrote a book on um, anti-Semitism and the racial science, right? This is before anti-Semitism was a bad word. Um, anti-Semitism and the racial science is basically about how Jews are um, naturally inclined to criminality because of the pick, your, phrenolog pick yeah. your phrenological explanation, right? I mean, yeah. that's what's going on. But I, my view is that the conspiracy theory stuff is really what's driving most of the modern anti-Semitism. Um, there are still racist anti-Semites, um, racially driven anti-Semites. There are still uh, religiously driven anti-Semites. I mean, those exist. But the big scary stuff right now is the conspiracy theory stuff. And that's why the, the GC stuff, I think, should really be worrisome. Uh, because that's where it's going. Yeah. Do you, do you have anything to add on that, Krista? I don't really know enough about the uh, just, grad scheme. Just about the um, racism stuff. I was like very, um, I'm not worried about the gender critical movement as like on ramping for far right racism and stuff. Uh, I think for a decent number of people in the movement, um, the guise is important. Um, and so you have these arguments about trans people that you could just transpose on to racist stuff um, where like, like demographic features, they a lot in public space and like women's yeah. spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, like that stuff is like exactly right. It's just like parallels to racist arguments. Um, but they, but when you do it, when people try to move it over and run it, they definitely um, are getting pushed back. And I think like when, <laughs> when you go from the level where it's um, like the conspiracy theory about all these Jewish people to saying the thing, um, there's pushback. From I think that it's maybe not surprising given that the <laughs> movement is getting big around like the idea that this is all feminism. Um, it's like centrally a, a movement that's hiding like what's going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like the, I mean, that's, that is like, I mean, there's people like Posey Parker who um, famously is like more explicitly like- A bit like, more extreme. Things. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been, 
Um, that's all I have to add. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Well, we can move on to the next question. Me, sorry, I moved to my bed because of like a homing instinct. Oh, the the sounds a little worse, but it's okay. Yeah. You can just sit close to the thing. Just, just speak into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the next question is from Andrew. Oh gosh, I just touched in. It suddenly scrolled. Andrew, he says, "What do you think is the way out of this modern anti-trans movement?" So I guess you mean what is like the end of it, or what is the way out? F I I'll go with what is the end end for us, or like what is the way out for us? What is the way out for trans people? Um, <laughs> I don't know, and it's kind of terrifying. I uh, what I'm hoping is it's just a mirror of the anti-gay movement in that. There'll, there'll be a big horrible push for years to come. I don't even think it's peaked yet. Um, and I think there will be wins and losses along the way and then it will kind of peter out probably after 10 or 15 years. And that is really horrible to think about and to hear. But I mean, that's what happened with the, the like scare around gay people. It just takes a long time for social movements like this to move on. Um, I am hoping that things happen a bit faster with the internet than they did back in the day. So maybe it won't be 15 years, though the internet also allows people to radicalize much more extreme and faster. So there's that. Um, I guess how this factors in with things like Brexit and the general global shift is also quite important. And it starts getting very complicated and impossible for me to predict. But I, I also hope that like short term people exposing gender critical for what it is will make like I do feel like they've got a little bit of a tower of cards at the moment and it's very well stacked but we're starting to make some difference um and yeah I don't know this year is going to be very pivotal I think there's a lot of big court cases like the Americans are getting involved um so yeah, we we'll see. I don't know. I'm not very optimistic about the UK having some big revelation and next year transphobia not being such a stress. I mean, healthcare is dire. Uh, they're pushing against the rights. They really haven't stopped. I don't know. I hope, I hope that um, Biden and the UN might do something. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see, I guess. Do either of you two have any thoughts on this or... Well, I guess I have, I've been thinking um, about the US side of things. Um, it, just, it feels like we're at this moment where it's becoming bigger in the US and yeah. it's like, what is going to happen. Um, I think there's two elements, it's like whether it's, how much trans people are going to be targeted um, by the people on the right, um, this is how much it's going to be able to emerge under this guise of um, a non-right-wing movement. Um, I feel more optimistic about, the, about resisting the second one, um, which I do think makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, but I think part of what is important for resisting the second one um, is kind of like understanding what it is that is, com <laughs> that is coming, <laughs> like what the thing is that's spreading. So it's not transphobia, Trans we have transphobia. <laughs> Uh, I think it's, it's a different more like grade the, of transphobia. Yeah, right. It's this like ideology that um, gets expressed in these complicated ways. Um, yeah, it's 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 transphobia, which is like the the fertile ground for it, and is um, wrapped up in it. But it's also like a conspiracy theory, and in its most extreme form, like a cult. And that's what's coming to the U.S. Like that conspiracy theory, that way of thinking, that way of framing things. Um, it's like it's rebranding the transphobia to make it more acceptable. I think right now the um, many of the people in the U.S. movement are um, extremists in a way that, like the or at least that wasn't transparent in like the early seeds of the movement in the U.K. Um, like the Jennifer Billick being more <laughs> central in the U.S. Um, yeah, yeah all, yeah. all your super crazies are picking up. Like Marjorie Taylor Greene's going to get on it. Like all, all of that lot, Trump's on it. It's just not going to be so easy to hide. I think that, you know, the culture war in America is very strong and it's quite clear which side is going to take which side in this 
like it's been clear all along who is going to take which sides in this and it's just going to happen so i also think so so i come out of the lgbtq community in the bay area originally and i remember a time when groups like the hrc weren't as clearly pro trans rights as they should have been and we used to joke about the the hrc gays right these sort of like wealthier um white guys who who had kind of climbed up the ladder and maybe weren't helping people get up the ladder yeah. behind them and i think that one of the things that has changed in the us for the better and i don't and from what i can tell this hasn't happened in the uk is that those groups have said no like the trans movement is Mar or the gay rights movement was marsha b johnson and sylvia rivera we're done with this crap like mm. we're we're gonna we're gonna go down and now they actually have after years of fighting the gay rights battle they have the political infrastructure and movement to actually make things happen um, because uh, they've become very politically effective and and effective in the courts too. We've we've got so, Stonewall. Um, we've got a few other like LGBT organizations uh, that are that are being more explicitly pro-trans than they were, which I guess yeah. is a similar mirror. But like all the political other political groups are just. But like, I don't think they're as effective. Like, oh, no, I mean, they're that's rubbish, what it rubbish. seems. That's what it seems like. Like they, they if the HRC. I mean, the, uh, the biggest one of these groups that has been really impressive to me has been Planned Parenthood, yeah. um, has been really great about it. And they've become very effective at fundraising. They're really good at this stuff. They have good political organizations. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know what it's gonna take in the UK. I agree with being less optimistic about the UK than the US, um, but, I think the long-term trajectory in the UK would involve major political parties yeah. being much less transphobic or even explicitly. Even taking a side, like the Green Party is having a huge internal strife at the moment, but at least some of the Green Party is explicitly pro-trans. None of the other parties are. So, well, I think jo Joanna Cherry getting kicked out of um, SNP. Yes, the SNP are now SNP was was trans. a good sign. They just had a definition of transphobia, which they all agreed on, well, which the party agreed on, and it's pretty straightforward. It's it's uncontroversial. It's like it, it's transphobic to call trans people names, and everyone's like, "This is outrageous! How can you have such right. a draconian definition?" No, it's ridiculous. Um, but but yeah. I saw I saw the Joanna Cherry stuff, and I didn't think anything was going to happen. And then all of a sudden she's gone and or she's she's getting sacked. And I'm like, okay. She is that's still great. in a party and she still has a lot of influence and there's still a thing going on. Well, and yeah. yeah, there's a whole fiasco. It, this skirmish is not over. But it's a step. Yeah, that's, it was that's, a step. that's fair. Um, Maybe I'm too optimistic <laughs> about that. Yeah, I'm a bit more involved in it all uh, directly. Um, about the movement though, is I think like with social movements, like the keys are just like, can they recruit new people and can they retain people? Um, and I think with the retaining people, um, I think right now, uh, at least, I don't know about right now, but I think it has been a um, fulfilling movement for people to be part of. Um, they've gotten major wins in like a relatively grassroots way, which is like, um, it's, it, it, people have agency, I think, within yeah. it. Uh, they feel like they're doing important work. Um, Billy is actually a person who is um, good at cultivating this um in that she will like i'm post about like how the people who are retweeting are doing like key work in the movement um and kind of helping foster this sense of agency uh, i think a key problem for retaining people in movements is infighting um it just like become <laughs> when movements are toxic people don't stick around they have a very uh, toxic movement like internally yeah. <laughs> if you step out of line it is grim yeah um and so i think that is a problem for them <laughs> Um, and then with the um, recruiting thing, I think they the, the major um, the barrier that I see like emerging is like people just knowing what is up, um, and like the people. At some point, you reach like the people who are this is appealing to are in it. <laughs> um, it's the hope, I think. 
Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to jump ahead to a couple of questions because I've just noticed a question I think looks quite good. Um, hopefully we'll come back to the others. So this is from Haley Marie Brown, who says, my question is for Krista. Um, do you think that the linkage of anti-Semitism and transphobia uh, has to do with the way the Nazi transphobia has failed to be acknowledged by historians? So, uh, yeah, I, I guess j just to maybe perhaps slightly rephrase it, like the, the Nazis did target trans people in a way, but it's less obvious and it's often just referred to as homosexuals and it kind of, um, and, you know, but yeah, sorry, what, did you have a view on that? I, well, I am not qualified to answer this question, I think. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I think part of it, with this, there was this Verso article who I cannot say the other's name, so that is terrible, but it's good and we can put it in the comments, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, about this arguing that like the, just like it was like central to the, um, Nazi homophobia in that it was just kind of all um, big gender variance type stuff. Like the sexual orientation was um, yeah. understood as like being like more of a woman and not. Um, and yeah, I, I, the question was whether this um, relates like with the emergence today is related to like the failure to conceive of this as part of yeah I and mean, I think part of it would be bad I think is bad like for the lesson of Nazism to be that like you can't target Jews that is a good lesson but there's also like other lessons about like the structure of the thought um that yeah. are really important in terms of like actually fighting the stuff in the future um and yeah I think that Probably if, um, you know, it's like the other, um, I, I, yeah, I feel uncomfortable okay. because I, I, I don't want to like undercut the centrality of the anti-Judaism, which is like the engine of all this stuff yeah. uh, on that side, the, on the Nazi, like historical Nazi. Um, but it's, it's worth keeping in mind, right, that a big, underpinning of Nazism, including Nazi anti-Semitism, was a very narrow um, view of what it was to be um, German and, and to be uh, human. To be normal. In the yeah, relevant, yeah. yeah, in the relevant sense, right? Like, um, so it's, it's not just, it wasn't just, I mean, Jews were, a large portion of the society there, but you couldn't be Roma, right? They were excluded, yeah. right? A lots of other ethnic minorities were excluded. Um, obviously anyone who wasn't sort of heteronormatively satisfactory was also excluded, right? So, um, I mean, I, I don't think that the Nazi example is a really good one for talking about the, the GC movement, because the, the Nazi movement was really driven by this racist, uh, the development of early race science in a way that I think is very hard to draw parallels to um, with other movements. But it does share a lot of the regressive traditionalist, um, and I'm using traditionalist in a pejorative way here, but, but th those sorts of um, elements which are um, highly exclusionary and any kind of essentialist um, you know you're either this or this this is how the world is this is natural this is it kind of view I guess is kind of related to that as well um, I, sorry go interesting. So, Joshua, do you have thoughts about the um, I mean I think the yeah I just I, <laughs> I agree slash believe you on the race science stuff being distinctive um, I'm wondering, like, how much is like an ideological parallel in the um, kind of like naturalization and like biological reality stuff they're doing? Um, I think that's more similar to the the modern neo Nazis. I think so. Yeah. So I, I mean I think that that as you get to, um, for example, the modern racist IQ debates, for example. 
right? That, that that's where it does look really similar. Cause it's like, oh, you know, we're not, you know, we're not racist because we think all black people have lower IQs, right? We're just reflecting the biological reality. Yeah. Oh yeah, that right? phrase. That's, yeah. that's the language. Um, and it's different because um, it's different because now we live in a sort of post Stephen Jay Gould world where people sort of look at this old school race science and go, yeah, most of this frontal, like all of the phrenological um, craniometric blah, blah, blah stuff is, is pretty much garbage. Um, and they're trying to preserve like one corner of it. Yeah. And sort of that's where the relevant similarity is to the gender stuff, um, I think, because it, it's, you know, a lot of those people are going to say, oh, well, you know, it's not the case that um, all of these sort of historical um, stories about how gayness happens is like going on, right? I, I mean, that that's that people were made gay because of they had a an estranged relationship from their father figures or something like that, right? All of that stuff is bunk, but what sort of persists is the attempt to carve out a little bit of legitimacy through the invocation, the broad invocation of, uh, quote, science, unquote. Um, and I think that's, that's where it looks similar, but that I think is a feature of, um, late 20th century neo-Nazism rather than uh, OG Nazism of the, right. of the 20s and 30s. Which I guess makes sense because it's... Um, a, a Cause it's contemporaneous. That's... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That yeah. wasn't a word I knew, but that's exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Okay. So there's, there's a couple of questions I've noticed here, which you might also uh, be good to ask on this, Josh. Um, so I'm going to ask both of them together. So one of them is from Lucy Marie 100, who says, do you think that anti-Semitism and transphobia will lead to wider civil unrest in the UK and US in the same way that racism has, which goes alongside with um, Lucy Marie's other question, which is, do you think doctors will be murdered for treating trans kids in the same way that abortion doctors have been? So I guess this is, do we think transphobia is going to lead to actual violence? And 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 anti-Semitism and are they linked? I guess. Um, well, the answer to the second question is yes. I mean, I, that that's the depressing reality. I mean, I made the parallel earlier. We were talking earlier about the anti-abortion movement. I mean, they killed people. Yeah. They still do kill people every once in a while. Um, I I would be really surprised if we don't see a bombing of a clinic in the next five years. Yeah. I would be I would be genuinely surprised. I hope it doesn't happen. I don't want it to happen, um, but I think it's pretty likely. Um, so that that second part of the question is is um, is a painful. Yeah, I think that's probably going to happen. It's like a what I was saying that is like I do like looking at the movement. Um, like that is like what it looks like is like. Yeah. I, like um, that's what I see too. Sorry, can like, you say that again? It's just looking like when I look at the movement, it looks like um, not that it's like intentionally laying the groundwork for it, but it looks like it is in fact laying the, the yes, the basic intentionally or of, otherwise. Right, I, and it's I think there's a significant element of chance with like whether someone happens to take it up, um, but yeah, I I think that's the direction that the rhetoric is moving in, especially like on the U.S. side. Yeah, I think yeah, I do think probably more likely in the US. I don't know, you just have more of a history of that, I guess. But and there's more people and um more people breeds yeah. more extremism. But um in the UK, I mean, in terms of unrest, like transphobic hate crimes have gone up like fourfold in three years or something. Uh it's just getting worse. Um I I I'm one thing I'm worried. I don't like saying this because I know as like a trans person with quite a big platform, I don't want people looking to me for strength and then me saying all these terrible pessimistic things. Um, so I guess I am a warrior and I am being pessimistic in general. And it's definitely worth talking to some older trans people than me who have been around to see all the horror in the eighties and nineties. And to them, this doesn't like, it looks bad, but it doesn't look as bad as it's been. But yeah. I do wonder after lockdown, like no one's been out. I before lockdown, twenty nineteen was an amazing year for me. Everywhere I went, it was just really good, and 
you know, everything was great. I had a really good year anyway, personally. But I do think, at least from my point of view, what happens when we all start going out again in lockdown? There's been 18 months, two years worth of radicalization and further extremism of gender critical. Like, is that going to translate to physical threats? Like, what's that going to what's that going to mean? Um, because things that it's like there's not going to be this natural progression. There's going to be a sudden jump. Like the last time I went out, it was a lot less extreme here than the next time I go out. Um, I mean, I guess the one worry that I have about the, and this is the first part of the question is, you know, does, do, does this sort of tension building create progress? And in the U S I mean, we talk about police, the, the police brutality stuff having resulted, the, the fact that it was finally publicized and there was a movement finally resulting in progress. But I worry that we get very wiggish about and, and, and um, sort of retrodict our histories a little bit here, right? I mean, Stonewall was a major moment in American LGBTQ history. Um, George Floyd protests and the Black Lives Matter protests were a major moment in history and, the, and they did have some consequences. But a lot of the time these things are a slow grind. And that's my major worry. I mean, I, anti-Semitism in the US goes up and down pretty frequently. Um, it's, it's up about 200% over the last few years. It'll probably go back down again and then it'll probably go back up again. Um, so I, I'm, I tend to be on the, not the pessimistic side because I think we are making progress, but um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to look at those things and say, um, these are gonna solve the problems, right? They're, or they're gonna pr- produce a satisfying resolution. Like I don't necessarily go, I wouldn't go that far. Um, but, you know, we keep grinding, right? You know, we're warriors yeah. and we'll keep, we'll keep working on this stuff. Exactly. It's, it's like the one advantage that trans people and Jewish people and gay people and everything have in their fight that the like oppressors don't is that like, I can't stop doing this. Like if they right. if they take away all my rights, I won't just stop campaigning for my rights because I've got to live my life. I'm going to have to campaign for my freedom for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. Whereas for them, for sure, it makes it easier because they can just pick it up and put it down. But equally, like, are they really going to be able to stay this passionately engaged for the rest of their lives? Like, fuck off. They're, they're weak. They're weak people, inherently weak people. So they're not, like, apart from the professional grifters who have made it their, like, profession but even that like they're not gonna they just got to keep the grift up is they just got to keep selling the numbers so whereas for us it's existential yeah right for us it's like we can't not do this yeah because our existence requires it exactly yeah um so uh i think if we aim to finish a quarter past then we've had half an hour of questions and we can get like two more and maybe one more in does that sound reasonable or are you about to yeah okay cool right so um uh so this is from a Caso PR. Um, do we know of any overlap or connections between GC and fascist groups such as the EDL? Could we see GC folding into a wider fascist movement? So one thing that I wanted to say actually earlier when you mentioned Tommy Robinson is that several of the um, more extreme reactionary side gender critical people who are bigger, uh, you know, have talk, talk with Tommy Robinson like him. I know that Tommy Robinson and Posey Parker have some kind of overlap going on. Um, like the people at We Are Fair Cop have promoted Tommy Robinson. Um, so that that's a common thing. And like it's it's obvious that EDL and BM like BMP, I think um one of the people involved in them wrote for some extremist uh, website recently about how trans people were uh, part of the great replacement because it's about making white people infertile um right. so you know it's not that I, I think quite often with these things that the extremists like all the extremists are obviously transphobic all all of the nazis are going to be transphobic all of the yeah. you know all the ideal people and all of them if they see defending women or whatever they're just going to take up that language because it works um that doesn't mean that all the gender critical people are fascists but i think all of the fascists are gonna just be gender critical by um you know the result of the kinds of things they do and what language is working at the moment 
they'll, they'll, they'll be more extreme with it and less clever with their wording, I suspect. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's, de there's definitely like explicit overlap uh, and, and support for each other. I mean, another thing is um, worth looking up, and I'm not going to say the names now because I'd, I can't remember them well enough to be certain, but like um, Posey Parker has been on certain people's internet shows who have dubious yeah. histories and talked at certain dubious conferences. And like Sonia Poulton is another one who has been on some very dubious related to the topic of today's episode podcasts. Um, you know, so there's there's gonna there's of course there's overlap, yeah. I don't know if either of you two have thoughts. Yeah, to kind of like carve out a little factor in whether um in like the gender critical people moving to the more traditional far right. Um I think part of it is like the reactionary um, weak gender roles um, that are normally associated with far-right politics. Um, I think that something that's important here um, with like the way that the gender critical movement is currently like building itself as critical of gender, sometimes even gender abolitionists, um, but the combination of, of wanting to abolish gender combined with reifying sex, biological sex, you could have a version of this view and be like a straight up Nazi, like a traditional Nazi, yeah. where you gender, which is like the culturally malleable stuff, you can put in like wearing makeup, um, trying to be skinny, uh, that kind of stuff. And then in the biological sex side, you have like motherhood. Um, and yes. if you biologize yeah. a lot of this stuff, then this, you can have this like gender critical view and like want to because a normal part of like ultra far right views are like modern womanhood being bad. And, like, and if you make that gender and then emphasize and like, then the biological sex thing is if I, that it can be a very far right view. You you, um, you see and, like it's very you I think you very explicitly see gender critical people taking bits of what like radical feminists might call gender and just relabeling it as sex and saying it's essentially. Yeah, motherhood <laughs> and pronouns like and motherhood. Yeah. yeah. The, the the way they are about motherhood is a big part for me. Yeah. Uh, where like it's yeah, that that is like I think a I mean there's like a like just say that is distinctive, but then like the bulk of mother is like a paradigmatic cultural role, right? Yeah. And then as soon as that is becoming like biological reality. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, you're not a woman until you've like breastfed a child kind Yikes. of thing. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, I think, I think, um, so I, I've talked about this in the context of um, the American far right a lot. Um, the conspiratorial wing of the American far right has always existed, at least in, at least since the 19th century. Um, the, it was never the dominant force in American right-wing politics until about 2010. And I, I, would, I joke with people, I said, look, this thing ate the American Republican Party. And what I don't mean by that is that I don't mean that every Republican is now a conspiracy theorist, but those people are now Not the yet. dominant, well, they're the dominant yeah. political force within the party, right? It's Donald Trump, and Kevin McCarthy and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and all these figures rather than um, Chuck Grassley and Mitch McConnell, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, the way that it happens. And, and so I don't know if I see, I think, um, I don't know if I see these sorts of fascist associations eating the gender critical movement in that way, but I think a lot of it will depend on how, um, gender critical figures react to people like Billick going full anti-Semite. Well, right? like I, think I think we if, know. They're going to just be quiet and hope it goes away. But that's what I mean, right? Is if, if that's what you see, then that should be a really serious worry. Because if it's, if it's Posey Parker and Jennifer Billick hanging with Tommy Robinson, then all of a sudden we're talking about a, a pretty politically significant movement maybe eating the Tory party in the UK or at least becoming influential in the Tory party in the yeah. UK. And that's, that's freaking scary to me. Yeah. 
So um, just and, just to and, be clear, I just want to explicitly say for the record, uh, I don't know if Posey Parker and Jennifer Billick have any association, or if Jennifer Billick and Tommy Robinson have any association. No, anyway, sorry, no, we're, I, I would, <laughs> but th this would be the worry, right? Is yeah. if we see these sorts of associations starting to crop up and we don't see any significant pushback against them, yeah. right? And like I, if we, yeah. yeah. The appeal to any gender critical people watching this, if you have- If you normal, made it this far. <laughs> if you have a normal movement, it is bad for your movement for there to be far right on ramping happening from it. For there to be a far right strand emerging in your movement is very bad for the movement. It should be against your goals and it should be something that you actively fight. This is something that move, like, other movements need also need to actively fight to like actively watch out for um, like Nazi entryism in green movements and stuff like that. It's, it's a problem that you guys are not unique in facing, but right now is just unchecked. And, yeah. uh, and it's bad right now. Um, and it's like, there are trans people who are Nazis, but there aren't trans rights activists mainstream pushing the LGBT rights position, which are accidentally turning into Nazis. They are like absolutely opposing positions. So. Uh, and then not talking to them, uh, they definitely, <laughs> they definitely want to not comment on this. And I think that it is important for us to do our best force to them. make that untenable. Yeah, force them. Like, yeah, I think I uh, have dropped the ball um, in terms of like tagging people in on this, but they should be tagged in. They should be asked explicitly about it until the answer. Right? Like, it's just people who have boosted this stuff before, it's just not acceptable for them to ignore it now. I, yeah. So that's what I would say to anyone in the chat who has the stamina for this. Uh, uh, Krista's pin thread at the moment, which is the summary of the last episode, uh, in that there's the PDF, which has all of the screenshots that we discussed. And in there, there's quite a few prominent gender critical people pushing this stuff and politely, uh, in a non-harassing way, when it's relevant, go and ask them publicly to comment on whether they still support this and what they're going to do about it. And they're going to ignore you. They're probably going to block you, but just other people just, they need to comment on it because it's extreme and it's grim. Um, and if they keep avoiding comment, then that itself is a comment, I think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. Oh, back to talking to any gender critical people. <laughs> <laughs> I, think if you, I think if you want to not have a ready on-ramp into anti-Semitism in the movement, uh, I think there's at least two things that need to be explicitly rejected. One is the idea that there is suspicious funding behind the trans rights movement, which there's no evidence for. That itself is like super conspiratorial. Um, it tends in this direction. The other one is the idea that your opponents do not believe what they are saying. <laughs> Both of these things are just going to tend in these, this dehumanizing, conspiratorial direction. They, they, they shouldn't be essentially connected. I think the second one is really, really important. Yeah. They, I mean, I, I, the idea that, that people have this suspicious end that's incongruous with what they're saying um, and that they are engaged in a deceit to do whatever the relevant theory is. I mean, that's the dangerous foundation, the, the moral foundation of conspiracy theories. And that's pretty scary um, because that's when, A, it gives you license to, dis to disengage um, and to focus on the echo chamber. And that's not really a very good idea. Um, and also it, it, it's a really quick, pivot from they're not saying that to these other things they're doing are in service of whatever the imagined malicious end are. Yes, right. Especially with the um, like teenagers transitioning, right? right? If like, if we don't believe that that is in their interest, which we do, <laughs> then right. it's very, very, like, very grim, very fast. Yeah. <laughs> which well, is... look, of course we believe it. Like, of course we also want the best for them. <laughs> we just think based on the evidence, it is yeah. having access to care. It's, right. it's not because we are trying to hurt them. But I think there's a problem with that is if you say they believe what's best and we believe what's best and we just, uh, we, we want what's best for children and they want what's best for children and we just disagree. Then we're like, okay, so what is, what does the science say? Well, the science happens to fully agree with trans people 
So that means two options. One, you change your mind, or two, you accuse the scientists of being in some big conspiracy. And that's kind of the only position you have. That's that's the only way you have to go. Like, the, sci the science just doesn't agree with you on trans kids. So either all science is wrong, which is a classic way out, or all the scientists are secretly lizard people, or trans people are lying. Like, that, they're the options, so. Well, and, and like, I mean, we talked about this earlier, right? When, if you think that, that doctors are, who are engaged in gender affirming care are um, doing something harmful or mutilating, whatever the term that they want to use is, yeah. that, gets, that gets into the, the, the same thing that we saw with the anti-abortion violence in the mid nineties. Right. I mean, it, it, get, it gets real bad real fast because when when you talk about kids like that, then people get defensive and people believe it's a fundamental justification for violence. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So I think we've like we've we've had a good run. <laughs> we've done um, we've done plenty. We've today. done some yeah. questions. Um, so I guess does anyone have any signing off thoughts? And um, I get, we've probably just done signing off thoughts. Um, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for joining us, Josh. It was for, like for very enlightening, and um, I hope that like you know everyone learned a lot. I'm, I did. So <laughs> I saw the chat saying that my face of like horror and then interest and stuff was very readable. As clearly, I was learning this stuff for the first time. <laughs> so also thanks to Krista, who again did all the research and I just sat here looking horrified the whole time, but you know, it's a vital role to play. So I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> but yeah. Mostly the same music from last time. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So uh, do you have anything you would like to plug Josh? No, I mean, Nothing. follow me on Twitter if you want. I, yeah. I, I'll put his I hand mean, in I, the, in the um, description. Yeah. I, I think I'm in the description already. Oh, thank, okay. Thankfully. Yeah, oh, well, so I, I mean, me. feel free. I, I'm happy to chat and talk more about this stuff. I have some papers, which hopefully will be out in the next few months, and I'll post them on Twitter when they are. But um, now I'm just in dissertation mode, so I don't have a ton going on, as uh, I'm sure is relatable for, for Krista. Yeah. <laughs> Krista's got an exciting show going Can on every week. <laughs> yeah. And my dissertation. Yay! Yeah, comm commiserations on that second part, at least. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you in the chat. Have a nice day. Um, it was good to see you all. See you next week, 9 p.m. UK time, 1 p.m. California time. I always forget Pacific time. That's what it's called. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye.